Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Gary Glowacki, and I'm joined today by Allison sacerdoti Vallot of the Craig Nobart Nature Museum, Dan Thompson with the DuPage County Forest Preserve District, and Callie Clatt Golba from Northern Illinois University. And today we're gonna to be talking about challenging and assessing need, implementing and evaluating reintroduction supplementations with herptofauna in the Chicago wilderness region. And that's, that's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, today we're gonna to be talking about why we can serve herptofauna and how we go about doing it in the Chicago wilderness region. Um, so the big question, why do we care about herptofauna? And the, the big reason is they're just a really unique part of our, our natural heritage. Um, the Chicago region is pretty rich in reptiles and amphibians, and they're an important part of the ecosystem. But in addition to that, they're really great indicators of habitat quality. So their persistence on the landscape tells us a lot about what kind of, of quality our wetlands, our prairies, our woodlands are in. Um, and they also be really good indicators of restoration success. So their persistence or their recolonization of areas can tell us a lot about how suitable the habitat is, not just for reptiles and amphibians, but a suite of other species. And as such, well, many people consider them a really good umbrella species and that if you can serve reptiles and amphibians, you're gonna be conserving a whole suite of other species um, along the way. And ultimately what we're trying to do is protect biodiversity and uh, uh, our, our local reptiles and amphibians are a really important part of that. So, um, sounds great. Let's go conserve reptiles and amphibians, but unfortunately it's really, really challenging. And a lot of that do is due to the, the urbanization of the Chicago region. Um, so wildlife in general, just not herps are, are faced with all kinds of challenges. And the big one is just habitat and fragmentation. So here's a 1939 aerial of a portion of Lake County. And you can see you're already starting to see a lot of agriculture, uh, but for the most part, the landscape is still pretty open. And then fast forward to today, and this is what the Chicago region looks like. Yeah, um, what you see is you see some pr great protected landscapes. So there's two preserves in Lake County and then housing and development in the roads. And this isn't really dense development, but you can see we have uh, Hastings Lake over there and then McDonald's Woods. So uh, yeah, emigration and emigration to and from these preserves is gonna be severely impeded um, by roads and subdivisions. Um, some other challenges are just the, uh, the pl plethora of invasive exotic species. I'm not going to go into detail. I know Allison's going to talk a lot about buckthorn in there. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with that. But things like reed canary grass buckthorn can really alter the, the physical landscape and uh, sometimes the chemical landscape. But then we also have other um, wildlife species that become problematic and change uh, water quality, water characteristics, and sometimes even chase out native uh, uh, fauna. So um, we got to deal with invasive species. And then a big one which is coming uh, to the forefront is climate change. So this is kind of a map of the, the, the climate zone and you can see northern Illinois is right kind of on that that border of kind of the, the northern cooler climates and the warmer southern climates. And um, if you go to the next slide, you can see if you're projecting out into the future, the landscape's gonna be very, very different. So that's something, if we're gonna conserve wildlife populations, we have to be uh, very aware of. So, and then reptiles and amphibians are particularly challenging because they can be very difficult to detect population changes. Um, so they can be, often be secretive Sometimes they're nocturnal or very cryptic. So monitoring can be very challenging. So sometimes they disappear from the landscape before you even realize it. Um, and sometimes they're only active for a certain part of the year. Um, they're ectothermic. Uh, they might need to have, have certain thermal regulatory uh, requirements. They also have very life history constraints would make conservation particularly challenging. Some species are case selected, care for the young, not care for the young, but um, invest a lot of resources in their young Delay reproductive maturity have extremely long generation times. Callie's gonna talk in depth about some of the challenges there in, in relation to turtles. Some are more R selected. They produce a lot of young, um, have short generation times, but those could be very big challenges. Allison's gonna talk and in, in specifically about that with wood frogs. And then the big one is just barriers to immigration and emigration. Uh, hurt people are always a little bit jealous of the people who work with birds because birds can fly. 
So if you build it, they will come. It's not the case with reptiles and amphibians. Um, in many cases, they're small, like a salamander, might have to cross many roads to get to these places. So us hurt people really have to focus on applied conservation. And there's several methods of this. Um, they include things like reintroduction and supplementation, translocation, sometimes captive rearing and head starting. And that we have to, as land managers, have to initiate um, projects specifically aimed at conservation. We can't just build it and let it come. Um, so, but we do some of these techniques in conjunction with restoration. We have to make sure the landscape can support these species. So when are these applied conservation techniques appropriate? And there's no guidebook and no rules. And uh, the Chicago region is, is, is great in that we've done a lot of groundbreaking work to try to restore some of these populations and uh, kind of provided a bit of a roadmap. Um, it's constantly changing, but you know, there's a lot of considerations we have to uh, take into account. So you know, when do you apply these kind of drastic measures that can be costly time consuming? Um, if you don't have a source population nearby for recolonization, or these barriers prevent um, that recolonization from happening. Um, so other, other times we have these isolated population that could succumb to inbreeding disease and some environmental change. That's where uh, humans can provide a little assistance in making sure that we have these populations here into the future. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to talk about too much of these. I'm probably going a little over my time and I, I really want to turn it over to Allison, Dan, and Kelly to really go into the depth. And you're going to see from these talks that no two species are the same, no two cases are the same, no two sites are the same. And it really takes site-specific analysis, long-term monitoring, and some research to figure out how you can serve these populations. So I think with that, um, we're going to turn it over to Allison. We'll just go to, go to the next slide here. And All she's right. going to talk about her project in Lake County dealing with wood frogs. Thanks, Gary, for the great introduction and overview of a lot of these issues that we have to deal with. Uh, wood frogs are an Illinois species in greatest conservation need, and they've always had a fairly limited range in the northern part of Illinois that uh, has a distribution that basically hugs the lakeshore where mesic forest with temporary or ephemeral wetlands are present. Wood frogs need these temporary fishless ponds in order to breed. They can't coexist in places that have fish because the fish feed on their eggs and they're developing tadpoles. So the species was uh, documented as historically present throughout the 1800s from museum specimens and from survey work that took place in the 1980s. But in the 80s, we saw a decline and then the eventual extirpation of wood frogs. So, Gary has already touched on uh, several of the threats that have impacted wood frogs, chiefly that of habitat loss and a uh, high degree of fragmentation by roads as urban and suburban development have continued. Um, another aspect of uh, conversion of our native habitats into agriculture was the installation of agricultural drainage tile through much of the region. And drainage tile is functioning to make land more arable for farming. And in doing that, it, it directly drains wetlands and changes the hydrology of the sites. So if it's present in a forested wetland like wood frogs would breed in, it's going to abbreviate the length of time that those shallow temporary pools hold water even further such that their tadpoles may not be able to complete metamorphosis and make it out in time. We also had the invasion of European buckthorn and glossy buckthorn, and that really proliferated through the 1980s and into the 1990s. And there's been a variety of studies that have shown negative impacts of buckthorn invasion in our woodlands. Uh, Liam Henahan's work has shown that it alters uh, leaf litter dynamics and soil arthropod community dynamics and uh, wood frogs and other amphibians really depend on both the presence of the leaf litter and that soil arthropod community for their food and for their cover so that they don't desiccate as they're trying to move between the wetland and the upland. Some of our work uh, during the late, two, late 2000s um, showed that buckthorn actually exudes a compound called emodin that can disrupt amphibian egg development such that their eggs don't hatch. 
we also had some issues with pond hypoxia uh, that was really driven by encroachment of silver maples. So when the drainage tile was present in the region, a lot of uh, silver maples moved in and were actually able to grow in what were historic pond basins. And they shade out a lot of the um, in pond vegetation that provides photosynthetic subsidies to those developing eggs and it makes it difficult for them to hatch. And there's also the possibility that some pathogens may have played a role in the decline. Wood frogs are particularly susceptible to two pathogens, chytrid fungus and ronavirus. Chytrid is present in the region and ronavirus is episodically present. And again, these are highly susceptible species. So in 1999, Lake County Forest Preserve District began a very ambitious and um, very successful hydrologic restoration effort in our main study site. They removed drainage tile, which rehydrated about 100 acres of ephemeral wetlands and cleared hundreds of acres of buckthorn. And this is something that requires a lot of ongoing control. They also used prescribed fire to help control invasives and encourage oak regeneration. And there's been a lot of canopy and uh, invasive understory management since that time to try to get a little bit more light into those ponds to promote that emergent vegetation that the frogs like and to uh, promote oak recruitment. So in 2004, I began working in partnership with the Forest Preserve District to see what the amphibian response to this hydrologic restoration effort and buckthorn clearing was. And we were specifically trying to see if any extirpated species would recolonize the site using potentially the Des Plaines River as a corridor. Now, blue-spotted salamanders and chorus frogs were two species that were able to hang on in the site throughout um, the times that it was becoming degraded by buckthorn. Um, but over five to 10 years following restoration, we did see recolonization by tiger salamanders, leopard frogs, and American toads. But there was no colonization by wood frogs because we found no viable nearby source populations remaining in the area. So the next closest population that could serve as a source that would be viable enough to withstand some degree of collection um, for reintroduction and translocation was in Northwest Indiana. And we chose to focus on egg masses because wood frogs and many other pond breeding amphibians have really strong site fidelity to the pond that they developed in and came out of. Um, further, if we look at the reproductive value of different life stages of amphibians, we find that adults have the greatest reproductive value. So if you take an adult from a source population and move it to another site, you're having a greater negative impact on the persistence of that source population. So by focusing on young, that population, that source population can still be very resilient and robust and not going to decline. And you're also considering this behavioral factor that the frogs are going to start forming a map of what the site looks like and know to return to that breeding pond later on so that your reintroduction can be successful. So we translocated egg masses into pond enclosures. And yes, these are pop-up laundry hampers that you might find at Bed Bath & Beyond. And uh, they're really great in order to uh, monitor hatching success and larval survival because these tiny little hatchling tadpoles uh, can't swim through that mesh. So we can get a count of how many hatch and how many make it to metamorphosis. So we used egg mass translocation between 2008 and 2010. And we've been doing follow-up monitoring to see whether this worked ever since. Uh, in recent years, we've also begun expanding our reintroduction effort to three additional sites. So when you do a reintroduction, it involves a lot of kind of waiting to see if it's going to work. Releasing the animals is not the end of the story. It's an important point to get to, but you have to follow up to make sure that you're actually establishing a self-sustaining population in the long run. Uh, with wood frogs, one of the challenges is that they have staggered maturation. So it takes females about three years to reach reproductive maturity while males uh, can mature in two. If you add to that the fact that we had some intervening drought years, we actually had to wait until 2014 when Lake County's Wildlife Monitoring Program first detected calls. Um, so four years following our last translocation of uh, egg masses into the site. These guys have a very kind of quiet call. They call underwater and they're explosive breeders, which means they'll only call for about two to seven days in a given breeding season. So they're easy to miss. 
We've been doing intensive monitoring of their population since uh, calls were detected in 2014, and we've been monitoring how they've grown and changed since uh, oak woodland restoration has occurred. And this video shows a really cool aspect of their life history um, and something that I was particularly excited to see. This is scramble competition. Um, this is multiple males trying to access a poor female wood frog in the middle of that mating ball of frogs. And so they'll actually wrestle each other to try to get each other away from the female so that they can, uh, they can fertilize the eggs. Now, most wood frog populations are male biased. So this is very characteristic of a wild population. In doing our population monitoring, we do annual egg mass surveys. And what's really nifty about wood frogs is that they have a one-to-one -one ratio between breeding females and uh, egg clutches. So if we can find an egg mass, that represents one single breeding female in the population. So we do double observer egg mass counts, and they often will use uh, kind of communal oviposition sites. They'll all lay their eggs along one submerged branch or in kind of one cluster within the pond. And this photo uh, in the upper right shows one branch that's actually coated with about 90 egg masses. So we can use that to get a direct count of how many breeding females there are. We also do sample uh, the adult population as they're uh, migrating to the breeding pond, leaving the breeding pond, and as juveniles emerge from the pond. And we do photo mark recapture using their unique patterning and photo recognition software to see if we've caught those individuals before. Through that, we can get survival rates and abundance estimates. We've also done acoustic monitoring using automated call recorders in the sites. And this uh, bottom graph is showing what their call looks like. This is a spectrogram, so you can identify, even if you're not out there, whether wood frogs were calling at a particular pond. And we've done some radio tracking uh, to monitor their post-breeding movements, as well as disease surveillance to keep an eye on how chytrid prevalence has changed through time. We've seen increasing population size um, through the years. So you'll see that in 2017, we hit a peak of 216 egg masses, and then it dipped down a little. So we may have had some females entering the breeding pool and some females leaving the breeding pool, but the number of females is pretty much stabilized in the 170s or so. And uh, we do have a male bias population. As you'll see here, it's become increasingly male bias in the last several years. We have a growing population rate of 1.3, so population growth rate of one means it's stable, less than one is declining and greater than one is increasing. And a generation time of about 3.3 years for one cohort to replace the next breeding cohort. If we compare the reintroduced population parameters to that of wild populations, we actually have very similar adult and juvenile and larval survival. Where we do see some differences are in egg survival and fecundity. So our egg survival is about 0.57 as an average over the last several years compared to some published rates from other wild populations of 0.76. Uh, what I have noticed happening is that the wood frogs are breeding typically the last week of March, first week of April. And if you particularly remember years like 2019 where we had two April snowstorms, if the ponds freeze again after the eggs are laid, that can cause egg mortality. So that's one of the factors that we're having to deal with. And if that becomes a more frequent occurrence with these swings in temperature in early spring, um, that can impact their hatching success. Additionally, we've noticed that their uh, fecundity, the number of eggs produced per female, is a little bit on the low end of the range, not uh, totally low. It, their range is oops, from 300 to 1,500. But um, 2019, we had an average of 376 eggs per female. And in uh, 2020, that increased to 605. And that is related to body size. So we do expect that to change through time. Finally, um, the main challenge is that the wood frogs only persist in one preserve. So we have no redundancy of, of their um, representation in multiple sites. So that means that they're susceptible if there was disease outbreak or some other sort of catastrophic event, um, we would lose this species from the region. And that's why we're trying to expand reintroduction efforts to establish them in several other sites. 
Roads are still limiting their natural colonization. They still have to deal with noise pollution, salt pollution, light pollution from factors that are surrounding the habitat. And buckthorn management, uh, re-sprout management is of course an ongoing battle. Um, one of the things that's been challenging is if you do a burn in um, late winter, early spring, it's often too wet to really carry fire through um, the area surrounding the pond where the buckthorn sprouts tend to encroach. And we've had uh, several Novembers with a very limited burn window where we can't effectively um, control some of those re-sprouts. So that's an ongoing challenge. So our next case study is focused on smooth green snake conservation. And these are projects in both Lake and DuPage County. And green snakes are a Chicago wilderness priority species, a species in greatest conservation need here in Illinois. And they're grassland specialists that have unfortunately uh, undergone range-wide decline throughout their geographic range, driven by habitat loss with conversion to agriculture and urbanization. And you can see that they're really small body. That top photo shows a fully grown reproductive female and the lower photo shows a about two week old hatchling. And you can see from their coloration, they're gonna be very cryptic. It's gonna be very hard to find these guys and track these guys in uh, grassland habitat. So we've surveyed over 65 uh, grassland sites since 2010 to try to document the distribution of this species. And we found that less than 25% of sites that have suitable habitat are actually occupied by the species. Um, where we find them are primarily remnant sites or places that still have some railroad embankment connecting them to places with remnant vegetation. Uh, that degree of fragmentation in the region and their small body size really limits their dispersal ability and recolonization ability. Further, if they do manage to disperse to a restoration site because of their small body size and the fact that they lay eggs, they can only produce a few eggs per female. The average is about five eggs per female. So it's going to limit their reproductive potential because it takes them a while to ramp up um, reproductive output and they don't breed till they're about three years of age. So in monitoring the species, we found several threats, the key one being very low survival of their eggs. We've monitored their populations in the field from 2014 to 2020, looking at egg fate, and it's ranged as low as 14% some years and as high as 68% with an average of 43%. So less than half of those already small clutches are producing young. And most of the loss is from desiccation of egg masses. And we noticed that as we have increased temperature amplitude during incubation, um, more swings in temperature, which is characteristic of sites that are in the urban heat island of Chicago, uh, we tend to see a greater risk of desiccation. When they don't desiccate, we then see more predation by invertebrates. And in recent years, we've seen ants, ground beetles, and uh, in the last few years, American carrion beetles, both adults and larvae, feeding on perfectly viable eggs. So in this middle photo, you see an adult carrion beetle eating some eggs. And here are larvae of the carrion beetle actually pulling developing embryos out of those eggshells and feeding on them from a communal nest. Another factor is shrub encroachment in nesting sites. So green snakes like to nest close to uh, wetland edges in grasslands, so sedge meadows and uh, marsh edges. And if those become increasingly shaded, they have to nest further away from those wet areas, which again makes them more uh, subject to desiccation. And a final potential threat is that of snake fungal disease, which is an emerging pathogen now known in 38 states. And this pathogen actually attacks the tissue, uh, typically on the face around the scales above the mouth. In some species like Massasauga rattlesnakes, um, infected animals have very high mortality rates. In other species like garter snakes, they're able to shed a couple of times and clear the infection. But at present, we don't really know what impact this will have. We have seen a few infected green snakes and we've seen this in um, fox snakes and milk snakes and garter snakes in the region as well. So for conservation approaches, we do a, we've done a combination of captive breeding, head starting, and direct release to try to evaluate which approach might work best for the species. And uh, with captive breeding, we found that they produce very small clutch sizes, often non-viable eggs, and uh, females can actually delay fertilization um, by a year 
so you don't necessarily get the stock that you're hoping for. So it doesn't really work as a standalone method to provide stock for reintroduction. And from my perspective, it makes more sense to focus on the eggs that are wild sired. They're, they tend to be more viable. So in head starting, we incubate those eggs to try to uh, get them past that desiccation and that predation risk. And uh, we hold a subset of them until they're about a year of age, rear them so that they have a better chance of surviving the winter and uh, that they'll be bigger and better able to produce larger clutches. Now, unlike turtles uh, with green snakes, head starting and getting them larger does not necessarily make them less um, vulnerable to predation as it, as it does when turtle shells um, start to harden as they grow. So um, they still have that predation risk, but the hope is that they're, they're better able to breed um, with greater fecundity. We also do direct release where we just focus on incubating and hatching out as many as we can and releasing them back to supplement existing sites and to reintroduce and uh, reestablish them in new sites that were uh, historically supporting these populations. And just to show you that occasionally we do have success, this is time-lapse of some of them hatching from a communal nest. So without intervention, we don't have the best handle on what the current regional distribution and viability of existing populations are. We get um, reports of people seeing one green snake in a particular site, but we don't know that that's a reproductive site or how those particular populations are doing without more intensive study. Again, that wild nest success averages about 43%. And from limited recapture data of one-year-old snakes, we estimate that that first year survival rate is as low as 7% to 17%. So if left in place, if we do nothing with the eggs, we actually need that first year survival rate to be more like 45% in order to offset decline. So by doing direct release and head starting, we can reduce that so that we only need 20% of hatchlings to survive their first year. Given how cryptic they are, that seven to 17% first year survival rate is likely an underestimate of how many actually do make it. Um, but again, um, focusing on getting them through uh, egg survival is really the best way we can conserve the species. Um, captive rearing, again, is not going to uh, be a standalone method, but potentially could supplement some of these other methods that we use. So um, for head starting and release, we have an ex situ incubation hatching success rate of 98%. We've incubated and hatched 1,068 smooth green snakes in the program. 229 have been released as one-year-olds and 740 have been direct released as hatchlings. So you can see that we can work with a greater number of animals using the direct release technique versus the head starting technique, but trying to get follow-up data on um, how they do with those different approaches is very challenging. They have limited detection. Uh, as adults, you might have a 30 to 32% chance of finding them when they're present, and it's even lower for the juveniles. They tend to clump in patches in grassland sites. So you can do a you know, kind of standardized survey combing a lot of habitat, but you may miss this one little spot where they all tend to cluster. And so it's very difficult to evaluate whether reintroduction efforts work with this species until you actually see nesting. We have no way to track gravid females prior to nesting because of their small body size. And they can actually nest below ground in crayfish burrows, cracks in the soils. Uh, and um, females can also retain eggs until they're almost um, ready to hatch until they're about four days from hatching. So um, site by site, female to female, there's a lot of variation in whether you will see eggs or not. So it really does take a lot of monitoring uh, effort in the long run. Finally, in terms of habitat management, uh, we do need mowing, burning, and brush clearing to continue to maintain suitable vegetation height that's going to really promote the thermal environment that they need for basking and nesting. That timing of those management activities, especially burning, should occur ideally when the snakes are overwintering, um, so after a first or second hard frost. And an important consideration is really to leave some unburned refugia for these snakes uh, if they come up uh, in spring to a completely 
blackened prairie, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb and they're going to move into kind of marginal habitats at the periphery of the sites, closer to roads where there's usually higher densities of predators until that vegetation greens up again. So by leaving some unburned patches or burning in a rotational fashion, you can really promote their long-term survival. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Thompson to tell us more about Blanding's turtle conservation efforts. Thank you very much, Allison. I uh, apologize for the mic uh, issues. I'm going to have to, as they say, phone it in today. Um, I, blinding turtle is a very interesting species as well and a great uh, com comparison and contrast to some of the species uh, Allison and Gary were talking about e earlier. Uh, it is a long-lived semi-aquatic turtle. Um, because of that, uh, it's frequently called semi-aquatic because of the fact that it does like to move from marsh habitat to marsh habitat, other aquatic wetlands, uh, so it does spend a lot of time on land. Uh, it is an umbrella species, as mentioned earlier. Um, with that, uh, we can go to the uh, next slide. Um, for, to understand what you're doing, you really have to understand how the population of the species you're, you're uh, studying is uh, relating to the environment and the habitat it's in. Uh, the best way to do that is through population monitoring. With the blandings, uh, the radio telemetry, nest monitoring, and trapping are the, the three main components that will really start to tell you how this population is uh, relating to the environment and also your management practices. It, you can learn more about the size of the population, uh, your age classes, um, you know, things like uh, survival rates, uh, fecundity, and uh, you know, their home range size. That, that's really telling too to show uh, issues with these species when they're actually starting to cross areas and you know road roadways and other factors that can put them at risk and predation. Um, Blanding's turtle uh, is challenging much like some of these others. Uh, it is cryptic. Uh, they are hard to detect, uh, particularly when you're trying to study the juveniles that you're releasing uh, to see how they are faring. Uh, so that that does provide a lot of challenges and again because this is such a long-lived species um, you're going to be needing to invest a lot more time to really see changes in the population and see what kind of impacts you are having. Uh, the blanding turtle, is, you know, there's a lot of conservation problems. You can see on the map um, that the, they, they were scattered around the state. Um, currently now only a few populations exist in, in, in localized areas and uh, these, these populations are facing many threats. Uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature uh, listed as a uh, red list or endangered species. Currently the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is uh, examining its status to see if it's going to get federal status or not. Uh, and currently the Illinois Department of Natural Resources has this listed as an endangered species. So you know, overall our conservation goals are to try to stabilize the existing populations that we do have but also explore areas where we can uh, repopulate historic sites and or new habitat that has been created that would be uh, suitable to uh, have viable populations. The blanding turtle has, like, like all species out there, there's many, many threats. Um, with uh, blanding turtle, uh, habitat loss and degradation uh, is, is key. Road mortality is very important, particularly in the case where you have females that may need to be making annual migrations for nesting. Lots of times that means they are leaving these aquatic habitats, needing to find upland areas, which in developed areas now uh, means high probability they may need to cross roads and road mortality is very significant. Uh, most of the studies in the area have shown how prevalent nest predation is and how seriously it's impacting the population. Uh, Mesopredator release, um, we already know these, these various species are relatively overabundant already due to changes in the landscape, and yet we still have organizations and, uh, uh, that are still releasing such uh, animals, uh, helping facilitate even more. Uh, disease has been uh, an issue and becoming a more uh, significant uh, concern here in the future. Uh, illegal poaching uh, still occurs. Um, you know, in the situation with the Blanding's turtle, it is state endangered. It is uh, illegal for anyone to possess it without a, a legal permit. Uh, most people recognize Blanding's as a turtle, but they don't recognize it as that specific species. So 
there's cases where there is illegal po poaching. The people are actually doing it for black market, but in some cases there's people that are just naive. They do not realize they are taking a protected species. Uh, and, and again, as mentioned earlier with uh, Gary, uh, climate change is going to have a significant impact. So if, if you kind of look at the cycle here, you can, you can already see uh, it's been very evident that nest predation is extremely uh, severe on, on turtle nests. And uh, it, there's just no, not enough young being produced naturally. Uh, survival rates of the juveniles are, are still somewhat low. And, and all the way into the sub-adults, through, through the adults even, they are, are significantly being impacted. So the lack of these juveniles right off the bat starts off to the point there are just not enough turtles being born to sustain this population at current levels. And um, even as mentioned before, you know, with the higher uh, predator rates and uh, road mortality and other factors, the adults probably are not seeing their full life expectancy as they should. Um, so these culminate all into a, a situation where you, you have uh, the Blanding's turtle in an extinction vortex where if we do not inter intervene, uh, we know the species will be lost. So conservation approaches, uh, again, habitat management, uh, you know, protection is first and foremost, but, you know, even once the habitat's protected, that's great, but uh, we all know, just like the species within that habitat, this habitat is under tremendous duress and stress and requires a lot of intervention and management. Uh, so just even saving the habitat is one thing, but there's a lot of work usually to maintain health so it can sustain a higher degree a suite of species. Uh, Mesopredator management and control is also becoming a, a required uh, tool anymore because we have seen uh, exponential increase in their numbers. So again, they are really having a severe impact on uh, maintaining you know, that biodiversity and uh, that nice balance that uh, previously existed due to all the changes in the landscape. Um, there has got to be more intervention by uh, us uh, maintaining these uh, populations of various species. And head starting has been proven, is, is now being proven to be a very successful uh, management tool. So again, habitat management, um, you know, we, we frequently talk about, uh, you know, conditions before uh, work occurs. Uh, I know lots of times we try to look back historically and see what these habitats used to look like because there has been so much uh, change uh, in the hydrology, a lot of field tiles placed, uh, a lot of rerouting of water, uh, things like that that we need to examine and, and, and address. So we, we do look at various restoration activities, uh, again, wetland restoration through enhancement of hydrology, and that's in many different ways. Uh, upland restoration is also uh, very important because it, it has a profound effect effect on the surrounding wetlands and invasive species uh, removal is always a challenge because uh, every year it seems like we're, we're finding new species that uh, we are now going to be dealing with here in the future. Uh, prescribed fire was a natural component of uh, management in the past and so we're, we're trying to use this tool as, as best we can and in recent years now too we've been finding burn seasons to be challenging that uh, we're not able to get the quantity of burns in as we have in the past. Um, so we're going to have to keep exploring new methods uh, to maintain some of the ecological health uh, and nest site modifications too, uh, trying to find ways to disseminate and distribute nesting so they're not uh, so clustered where it's so easy for uh, predators to just access as many nests as possible. If we can scatter those out and provide better habitat, um, I think we can have better chance because our end goal is always to find, you know, rebuild this population and then allow them to be self-sustaining. And so as, as mentioned, uh, head starting uh, has definitely been proven to be very successful. Um, throughout the, the programs here in DuPage and Lake County, uh, DuPage since starting in 1996, you know, nearly 2,700 hatchlings have been released. 
Uh, Lake County, when, since their inception in 2010, they've released 1,200 individuals. So you can see, too, this is one of those things. Um, this is significant time commitment. Uh, and, and to do the head starting, you need to, uh, we're raising these turtles over winter from the time they hatch in late summer throughout winter and then probably being released in the spring or even summer. Um, so it is a big commitment annually to be going through and caring for all these individuals. Um, so as you can see in the top, here's one of the one-year-old juveniles um, getting ready for a release. Uh, down below, what's exciting is the fact that, you know, both of these organizations, Lake and DuPage County, have been doing this for such duration, they've actually seen some of their head starts actually achieve uh, maturity, which, you know, for the Blanding's turtle is usually in their mid-teens, early to mid-teens. So, um, you know, that's a big significant time commitment just right there. Uh, but also, if you look at it, um, this is only a start, and we need to continue this to kind of rebuild some of the numbers. And I think we have a little video here of uh, Juvenile getting released. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Kelly with NIU, and she can take it from here. Thanks, Dan. So we got to look into some of the specific results from these long-term landing turtle monitoring and head starting projects. So this figure here shows the results from a lot of work, um, and it's showing the body size distribution in length of uh, these populations for each site, pre-management and post-management. So in both sites, you can see the top pane that's showing pre-management. We're seeing a lot of adults, so a lot of bigger turtles and they're wild born because they're those white bars there. And this means that there's not, there was not enough recruitment going on and these populations were just, even if they were laying eggs, the eggs were not making it out of the egg stage or being able to be detected. So these were basically populations that were doomed to become extinct. And then we could see in the bottom panes, of both the DuPage and Lake County, a lot more stable population structure after management. And we're attributing a lot of this success to head starting. So the black, um, the black bars are showing head started turtles. So we're seeing a lot more younger head started turtles. Um, and then some of these turtles are even recruiting into the adult population. So we're seeing a lot of success in this population uh, dis size distribution, which this is what a turtle population should look like. And it's important to note that there's some differences between these two sites that are uh, kind of significant and interesting. So in the Lake County population, we're seeing that it's taken a shorter time to get the stable population size. And also in Lake County, we're seeing some natural recruitment, which is indicated by the white bars on top of the black bars. So there's actually some natural nests that are making it to adulthood. So um, if there's a few possible reasons for this difference, but one might be the implementation of a conservation strategy, a meso predator controlled conservation strategy in Lake County. Um, so like Dan was mentioning before, the raccoon population size is at least a thousand times larger than historically. This is because they're able to adapt to urban environments. And then we've also extirpated their natural predators, so things like wolves. So these raccoon populations are allowed to grow almost exponentially. And unfortunately, raccoons are one of the biggest predators of turtle nests and young turtles. So they can have huge effects on turtle populations. And so in sites without any predator control, um, we're seeing that there's almost no natural nest success. So all these nests are being depredated like this top picture here where we're just seeing eggshells. And then also young turtles and even our head started turtles are being depredated more in sites without this uh, predator control. And then in Lake County, right after the removal of raccoons, we saw immediate positive effects. So there's natural recruitment, so there's more nests that were actually hatching out, and then the head starts and wild turtles were having higher survival rates. 
So another threat to turtle populations uh, is disease and population health and poor health. Um, and this is something that Allison talked about with her species. And this is especially important to look at with uh, these rare and endangered species. So we partnered with Dr. Matt Allender's Wildlife Epidemiology Lab at University of Illinois to address some of these threats. And so one of the big things they've been doing is monitoring disease in the populations that we have. And this is to make sure that we're not gonna have some big turtle pandemic and lose these few populations that we have left. And so far we haven't seen anything like this, but it's something that uh, we wanna keep watching to make sure that if we start seeing something, we can do something before it's too late. And also something that they've been doing is establishing baseline health values. So before uh, Dr. Allender and his lab came out, we really didn't know what a healthy Blandings turtle looked like um, in terms of blood work and biochemistry and things like that. So they were able to come up with baseline health values so we can now tell whether or not a turtle is healthy. So compare turtle to turtle in a population and then also compare between uh, one population and another and kind of put that in terms of um, population, the uh, habitat that they're in. If it's degraded and we're seeing poorer health, then there's direct implications there. So overall, um, there's a lot of ongoing work with the Blanding turtles, but we're seeing a lot of positive evidence that management can help Blanding turtles, but there's still a lot of challenges. And some of these challenges echo the same challenges that Allison was talking about. But one uh, unique one for the Blanding turtle is their complicated life history. So because there's a lot of distinct life stages, all of these require different management actions. So for example, the hatchlings or the nests, they would benefit more from things like nest site modifications or shallow, uh, shallow wetland modifications and things like predator removal, whereas adults might benefit more from modifications from bigger wetlands or from um, road, road mitigation projects and things like that. So it doesn't just take one strategy. There's many strategies to protect this species in its whole life history. And then on top of that, they're very long lived. They can live over 80 years old. So this is a long term commitment. So it's, it takes a long time to figure out what's going on with the population. And then it takes a long time to do the actual work and then to do the follow up monitoring to determine that our work is actually making an effect is something that we have to wait a long time to actually see the effects of our um, of our work. It's like Dan was saying, in, when we release these turtles, it takes several years, like 10 years for them to reach reproductive maturity. So once we put a turtle out into the wild, that isn't where things end. We have to keep watching and make sure they actually make it to reproductive maturity and they can reproduce and help this population to get this self-sustaining cycle. And like all of these projects and all conservation projects, public support and funding are huge parts and huge challenges to actually doing the work. So having the public understand and actually be interested in this conservation is important so they can support us and make sure that it actually works, especially for things like mesopredator control. Um, and so knowing that they have the science and are able to understand it for themselves. And then like everything, funding is something that is a big challenge because this is such a long-term project and there's so many people that go into doing this, the animal care, the technicians, the other wildlife biologists and things like that. There's a lot of people working to do this and it takes a long time. So that's always a big important part. But the positive thing about a lot of the Blanding's turtle conservation efforts is that they can have a lot of positive effects on other species that live in their habitats as well. well thank you everyone. And uh, we just want to quickly acknowledge the huge list of field technicians, animal care specialists, funders and project partners who've gone into making these programs what they are today. So thank you all so much and we'll take some questions. 
So you were doing a great job of, of keeping up with the questions in the chat as we were going. Um, and so I'm curious about, um, you know, anything that one of you wants to expand on from some of those questions as a way to get going as people get more questions into the chat. Well, we had some questions about uh, climate issues and kind of future effects on these populations and these various organisms and how um, climate imp change implications may affect them. I know uh, Kelly answered one of those questions with regard to temperature dependent sex determination in turtles. I don't know if you want to speak to that a bit more. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting thing about turtles. Uh, the hotter temperatures produce more females and colder temperatures produce males. So with the warming climate, if um, all the nests are too hot, then we're just going to end up with a population of only females. So this is a really direct way that climate change can affect the turtle populations we have. Um, in terms of amphibians, we run into issues with uh, kind of the frequency of droughts being an issue. Um, so if you have multiple years where they can't make it through metamorphosis, then you can have an impact on you know, population growth with lack of recruitment, especially when you have these kind of fragmented, isolated populations because you don't have any gene flow, you don't have places where they can kind of make their way from and recolonize that patch. So that certainly becomes an issue. And um, as I mentioned with the green snakes, the egg desiccation issue is uh, something that we're seeing as uh, more pronounced in our study sites that are within the urban heat island of Chicago. So we see greater temperature amplitude during the incubation window. So some of the Lake County study sites where we work, we don't see uh, quite as pronounced an effect, but if we go you know, west into DuPage County, uh, we do see more of that effect. So some of that depends on where you're, you're located. It looks like we have some questions about hibernacula and snakes, and then some measle predator things. Mm -hmm. Allison, you want to talk about the hibernacula? And Gary, do you have anything to say about the measle predator stuff? Um, in terms of snake hibernacula, I don't necessarily see that in, at least in my study sites, that that is the main limiting factor uh, for their survival. It doesn't mean it's not the case in other sites. Um, with smooth green snakes, for example, these are uh, grassland dwelling snakes and they make use of uh, the ant mounds that you would find in, in the prairie. So if you're in, let's say a newer restoration where maybe less of those ant mounds have established, that might be a limiting factor, but they'll also use crayfish burrows, they'll use rotting logs, but we do find multiple species of regional snakes like garter snakes and brown snakes and red belly snakes um, and fox snakes also using that railroad ballast um, that, that serves as a boundary and um, cuts through many of our regional preserves. So that resource is there, the downed wood is there, um, I think, shrub encroachment is probably a bigger issue with regard to nesting sites and just in, in terms of their, their kind of spatial use um, in the site. It kind of constricts them into these little narrow pockets that might have higher predator density, for example. And as far as the meso predator controls, um, <laughs> uh, the question there. So in Lake County, we've been working with uh, USDA Wildlife Services to uh, control uh, raccoon populations that are uh, landing turtle sites. And we've worked with adjacent landowners, uh, their conservation partners, and um, um, and tried to educate the the neighbors and residents around the area. And surprisingly, we've gotten a lot of support. We haven't gotten a lot of criticism of it, um, and things have gone pretty smoothly. And, and as you saw, we've had some pretty good a good success where we've able to increase nest success for the turtle population. So. Um, uh, when you explain the with facts and the reasons why it's necessary, uh, people are generally supportive. Um, raccoons are cute, but uh, they do cause a lot of problems, just not for wildlife, but in people's homes and things like that. So um, um, people have been very supportive and we've been very appreciative of that. And I see a question about uh, how do you keep small populations from inbreeding? Um, 
that's part of uh, the goal with with many of these programs is to, is to provide some degree of genetic rescue um, in as fragmented an area as we're in that that is very difficult. But we do have some natural corridors like rivers um, and we have you know, certainly stepping stone preserves uh, for certain species, but the degree of inbreeding that might occur in, in genetic isolation is, is gonna be related to dispersal abilities of various species. Um, so, you know, small frogs can't disperse uh, much more than a kilometer, if that, and turtles and snakes certainly both run into the road mortality issue, and, and that is um, a major issue for, for uh, adult survival. I see a question from Peter about skunks. Um, it, in terms of turtle nests, striped skunks do play a role, um, but they don't seem to be as adept at raiding um, every single turtle nest as raccoons are. So we've caught on uh, motion detecting cameras, skunks depredating turtle nests. But in every case that we've caught them on camera, it's been a partial depredation. So, you know, skunks are smaller, so they don't seem to eat all of the eggs. So maybe a few of them hatch. So we've actually caught a skunk and I think we had a little um, animated clip in the presentation, but I don't think it actually played, but it showed a skunk actually eating or digging up a nest, eating some of the eggs. But in the actual video, you could actually see a hatchling crawling away from the nest. So at least one escaped, um, a few eggs were left. And then um, also when we came back the next day to check the nest, we found another hatchling. So at least one, maybe two survived. And we've caught it a few times where they'll maybe eat the top three or four eggs, but leave a few eggs in that nest chamber. So um, skunks don't seem to be as big of a problem. So if they're eating a few eggs, um, that seems to be okay. And if you look at some of the population modeling that Callie's done, that uh, Justin Congdon's done in Michigan, you know, if, if you get about half the eggs to survive in a given year, that's pretty good. So that's our target. So skunks uh, don't seem, it doesn't seem to be the case that they're going to wipe out, you know, 90, 100 percent of the eggs that are out there where raccoons are very smart. They eat a lot more um, and can really do some devastation. So we have something we've watched, we've been concerned about, um, but at least at least up until now, they don't seem to be uh, a big problem. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I see Cassie is asking about if we have done any work on um, translocation for species that uh, from southern or western areas that might be suitable uh, to translocate to the region. Um, generally, we are focused on trying to um, maintain the populations of the species that are already in the region rather than um, kind of focusing on future suitability, if, the, if that's what you're asking about kind of uh, assisted migration. I'm not sure if that's kind of the direction you're going with, with the question, but um, typically these types of projects do uh, require a lot of pre-reintroduction monitoring data uh, to actually demonstrate that there is a need for the conservation of the species in the region. And then we have to kind of identify the threat. So that takes a lot of research and groundwork um, and then you would have to identify source populations and do habitat suitability modeling and population viability modeling. And then after you release any um, of these species, you would have to do post-release monitoring for a number of years to see that these, these efforts are actually working and potentially go back and reevaluate what is and what is not working. Um, not sure if anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Okay. Thank you so much, Allison, Kelly, and Gary for being here this morning to answer questions throughout the session. And thank you too to Dan who had technical difficulties and wasn't able to get on the session this morning um, for his great portion of the presentation. And thank you to all of you in the audience for peppering um, the panelists with questions for being here for this great first Saturday morning of, of Wild Things. 
Um, it was quite a romp through through um, wildlife with with insects and reptiles and amphibians this morning. And please do join us after our lunch break. We're now going to take a break until one um, for an afternoon of uh, sort of unintended um, flying wildlife. <laughs> so so we'll start at one with a panel conversation um, about Monty and Rose, the piping plovers at Montrose Harbor, including a screening of Bob Dolgan's film about their first season. And we'll get an update from our panelists about how they did in season two, what the future might hold, and piping plovers in the region. Um, that will be followed by some great new research about birds on the Chicago River, um, especially near the city center. Um, and then we'll talk about the Clark Street Bird Sanctuary, Eden and Evanston, later on at 3.30. And we'll close out the afternoon with a session all about Illinois bats. So again, all things that fly as we continue through our wildlife day here at Wild Things. And don't forget to get your t-shirts, get your tote bags, all that good stuff. Um, and we will see you back here in just about an hour. Thanks so much.